Okay, so good morning, everyone. Um, so this project is kind of a, a subsection for my PhD dissertation, which I'm studying the political economy of the development of Chinese internet economy. And for today, I'll basically talking uh, about the current um, development of the scope and scale of Chinese internet economy vis-a-vis um, -vis the global uh, in the global uh, marketplace and bring out the significance of why should we um, pay such attention to data policy and how Chinese government are developing this uh, discursive and justification for the needs to localize data. And secondly, I'll trace back to uh, several historical formations for the Chinese government's view on big data. And I'll look very familiar, primil very preliminary uh, for the implications for companies and users and uh, further with some discussion and questions. So first, let's look at some basic data. Um, these are uh, world largest internet companies um, by term of user population. As you can see, the word in blue are uh, the population of those countries. And what's very notable is that a lot of uh, uh, internet companies have a population, user population that larger than the population of some of the whole nation. Right, and then you can see WeChat and Alibaba, and um, yeah, and those two are Chinese ones, and the rest are dominated by the U.S. And the second one is uh, top internet companies by revenue, and as you can see, this chart is also single-handedly dominated uh, by U.S. and China. And uh, the Chinese companies are doing increasingly well in terms of uh, revenue over time. And last but not least, um, top internet companies by market capitalization. Um, also, interestingly, um, China and U.S. are dominating the charts with the Chinese internet uh, market capitalization increasing almost tenfold over the years. Right. Um, and I think that's brings to the significance of we, why we should pay attention to the Chinese, the rising, uh, rising Chinese internet economy is that uh, these companies are used by a large user population and dealing with data flowing over the, uh, the borders. And what is notable is that only half, more, uh, slightly more than half of Chinese internet population, Chinese population are wired to the internet. So these companies are potentially having also half of the population uh, coming into uh, to being a, a huge market for future services. Okay, and I was just returned uh, from my PhD field work two days ago, and uh, as clear, I already mentioned, it's a virtually a cashless society in China. So this is what happened when I went into a sushi sushi restaurant in China, and there's uh, this QR code on the right bottom corner of the table, and you scan the QR code using WeChat, which is a social media uh, app. And then this page pop up. So there's no menu, there's no physical menu. So you order from uh, your uh, social mobile mobile phone. Okay. And you pay, you can also pay uh, using Alipay and all, all those uh, payment system. And this is in Zhongguancun, where kind of the one of the most uh, earliest high tech center in Beijing. Um, and you can see these bikes are the bike sharing uh, companies um, in China, and you also don't need to pay. You just have to have your mobile phones, have your WeChat uh, app, and you can scan the QR code and automatically the back will unlock. Right. And this says how much data we're processing our mobile phones daily in China and how much this data are stored and owned and shared and disclosed, disclosed by these companies. So here I kind of uh, listed a few key points uh, in terms of Chinese internet governance and their governance uh, agenda in terms of uh, the formation of a very systematic view on internet governance and more specifically on data governance. Right. Um, so I'll just basically quickly run over through this. Uh, as in 2010, the Chinese government, actually the state council, issued a white paper on internet governance 
um, basically stating their very basic logic and fundamental rule in terms of regulating the internet. And here, the concept of internet sovereignty kind of really uh, stood out, as the Chinese government sees the internet as, um, first of all, kind of uh, should be under uh, the regulation of the states. Right? And then there's a, the Snowden revelation, where the government really very smartly take advantage of in terms of uh, advocating for more indigenous technology and installing backdoors to uh, local technologies for government to access. And the government further reinforced the concept of internet sovereignty by holding World Internet Conference. Um, and this is starting every annually since 2014. And you have the Internet Plus plan, where the premier Li Keqiang really um, uh, strongly advocate in terms of we should um, take advantage of digital technology in terms of re reinvigorating national economy. So uh, here you can see the really increasing role of private companies in terms of, uh, for example, helping a huge uh, state-owned company in terms of uh, opening market and um, selling their products overseas. And also the rules in terms of government procurement with very specific requirements uh, and for local uh, indigenous technology companies and the development of social credit score system and most recently the new cybersecurity law. Okay. So I'll go into, first of all, the Snowden in China. So um, the Chinese government really capitalizing on the opportunity uh, of the Snowden revelation argued that we should have more Chinese internet companies and Chinese technology companies in providing our very basic information infrastructure. And the most uh, uh, significant manifestation of uh, such view is in the government procurement list. And so before Snowden, there were roughly about 60 of uh, Cisco's products on the government procurement list. But after Snowden, uh, the number went down to zero. And a lot of US and American companies especially suffered from uh, the changes. So Apple and Intel and several other systems were get was uh, was uh, kicked out of the list, and um, so overall the number of approved foreign products reduced by one third. Okay, and this is the uh, statements by the State Council in 2010, and it's very clearly stating that the Chinese government believes that the internet is an important infrastructure facility for the nation. Within Chinese territory, the internet is under the jurisdiction of Chinese sovereignty. So they must obey the laws and regulation of China and consciously protect internet so security. And it's not surprising that Chinese government is one of the mostly controlled, tightly controlled of the internet. Um, but it's also um, such regulation also have very political, uh, very significant political and economic implications. So for all of the U.S. or foreign you know, companies going into China, they have to, first of all, um, agree to uh, obey the, the, the government when the government is saying that you should censor this and uh, do that. Right? So it's a huge uh, cost for the operation of the company. And as we, we see in the case of uh, Google's withdrawal in 2010 from mainland China, um, it, it, the issue has been uh, hi highlighted and contested. Okay, so I'm going to focus this on the recent cybersecurity law because uh, this is a, one of the most hated, debated um, uh, legal documents um, in very recently. And here we we kind of see the emergence of data protection, localization, and sovereignty kind of emerge uh, as with this law. So the first draft was, was pro uh, promulgated in July 2015. And it was passed on November 2016. However, this law has not become, um, has not came into efficient uh, operation till July, till June 2017, because nobody knows how to do it. Right? So the, the one of the most significant requirement of this law is data localization. It argues, uh, it regulates that for operators to provide data outside mainland. Um, there has to be s security assessment conducted on those services. So one of the critiques, actually, uh, about, about such law is that um, 
there is huge confusions of what con uh, what constitutes security assessment. And should you uh, give government access to your source code, which con constitute uh, business secrets and um, various other issues? And one of uh, the major opposition come from foreign business. Actually, they signed a letter um, to the government contesting this loss. And differently from what is the norm in the, in the U.S., this is not a voluntary law, it's mandatory. Okay, and there's a social credit system. Um, what's, I think as also Claire has presented, that was one of the most significant development in the system is the involvement of private actor. And so especially the Sesame Credit, which owns by Alibaba. So Alibaba is also the largest e-commerce provider in China. So they host um, your banking information, your purchasing uh, history, right? And they also uh, have the internet loan services. And so, um, so it kind of knows everything. Um, and some argue that this is not only about control, but also about building a critical informa information infrastructure. So underneath is the app for uh, Honesty Shanghai, if you would translate it. Uh, so this is uh, one of the kind of pilot program that went into effect in Shanghai, and I think you, depending on your credit score, it's kind of the black mirror situation happening here. Right? So you can only purchase a new energy car if you have a credit score higher than 700, let's say. So it's really affecting the everyday life. And you can also get some discount if you have a good credit score. Okay, so for the company's perspective, um, for LinkedIn, uh, there are a few examples I would br briefly mention here. So for LinkedIn, it went into China before the cybersecurity law, but it has, has already kind of uh, showcased its willingness to gain the market in exchange of data localization. So it's already put their servers in the mainland China. And for Airbnb, it launched a Chinese uh, version of services. And I just read through the privacy policy yesterday, and it kind of distinguish the uh, locality of these users. So if you use the service in, within China, uh, then your data is stored locally. If you are from, from outside, the, the data is stored in Ireland. Okay. And for implications for users, um, I think we should put into context the development of privacy as a concept and as a policy in China is that we have a very different cultural uh, understanding of, of privacy. And um, the regulation or protection of, uh, of privacy has been dispersed in various uh, regulatory authorities. And there are some policies that already exist that kind of uh, are enemies to um, privacy protection. So the government asked for a real name registration policy in um, everything, like everything related to the internet, right? When you register for a, a Chinese Twitter user account, you have to register with, with your real name and information. And by 2015, uh, in December, there's a report released by the Chinese Internet and Network Information Center. Um, they're saying that almost, with the with popularity of mobile internet uh, communication, that almost um, ninety six percent of mobile internet users in china has has encountered uh, information security incidents so from my perspective, where I study political economy of um, of Chinese internet, it, I argue that it 's not only about control and surveillance but also carries important implications for trade and economic development. And this also related to um, the recasting of and recalibration of state power over the global internet, as discussed uh, by some of scholars such as Ronald D. Beard, is saying that through data, uh, data localization policy, the states um, can have an effect, a regulatory effect, over its users in foreign jurisdiction. Right. So, like WeChat, if you are a, a WeChat user, that thing registered in China, but you come to the U.S., but the, the um, social media app still censor, apply the same censorship uh, standard if you kind of move to different countries. 
right? And also for Cheetah Mobile, which is a very less known Chinese uh, internet company, but they are very popular in terms of uh, mobile applications. So they developed the tool to um, the, the cleanser masters that installed on many Android phones, and they're downloaded are among the top um, Google Play and Apple Store. And and what does it mean for this country, for this companies, if we if they wanted to go overseas, and how does cybersecurity kind of apply to this company, and how does it affect um, its users overseas? Okay, so that brings the end to my presentation. So I look forward to your comments and questions. Thanks. Uh, my talk today will be very improvised since I'm not the uh, principal investigator of this project. It's my colleague Laura Marenbach, who would unfortunately not be uh, coming here today. Uh, so uh, I will try and uh, kind of give you my perspective on the project that we are uh, currently working on. So it's another work in progress uh, here. And I hope then with my presentation I can come back to questions that the three of you already uh, uh, opened up and that we can then uh, discuss um, in, in the discussion block later. So basically at our work uh, at the Technical University in Munich at the Professorship of Computational Social Science and Big Data, we are very much informed what Yannick has just told us, you know, uh, the, the, this idea or also this, this uh, moral shifts from uh, this uh, traditional idea of information society that was very prominent in the 1990s, which uh, came with all these imaginaries of empowerment, democratization, and all those other imaginaries that we know that came along with the World Wide Web and the Internet. And we see now this shift in the, from the middle of the 2000s uh, up, up until now, uh, and this transformation to from the information society to a digital society, mm -hmm. uh, which is actually uh, coming with a lot of different uh, uh, connotations, as Yannick has beautifully shown. But uh, we, so we have this in mind in our, in our work routines, but somehow uh, in, our, in our work there at the university, we are dealing with, uh, very often dealing with global perspectives on big data and digital society and stuff like that. And we always had the feeling that hmm, this is such a northern uh, perspective that, uh, especially when you deal with people that work for work in China or in India with those big data systems that are really, in a way, not having the same logics as we encounter them because they are bridging very differently narratives of empowerment. I'm coming back to this in India, for example, and uh, uh, surveillance, if you like. <laughs> And it's very, very different of what we have in our uh, view, especially in Europe and North America. Um, maybe even then, again, different in Latin America, uh, not to speak about Africa, uh, which is a total other story again. So uh, we decided to start looking into these other discourses and try to understand them so that we can also uh, use this knowledge in our work with policymakers because this is what we do. We also do a lot of consultation for policymakers. And we always come with our northern, uh, global northern perspective in our backpacks. And so we, we said this has to change. And so uh, my, I'm a sociologist. I'm a sociologist of technology especially. But my colleague Laura, she comes from international relations. She is a political scientist. And she comes from international relations. And already, as you can imagine, I don't know how many people here in the room are political scientists or international relations or sociologists or whatever, there is a clash. Uh, an interdisciplinary clash uh, going on. I'm not going into detail here, but we, we have a lot of discussions about uh, how to kind of implement the context that the regional, local, uh, but also national uh, uh, context of governance into our uh, understanding of those global discourses. And so in the international relations literature, uh, which, is <laughs> which was especially surprising to me, I have to be honest, uh, much of the controversy centers on this particular idea of intent. Why are uh, governments using big data or uh, in a broader context think about this um, uh, transformation uh, to a digital society? But the why is then um, in a way explained sometimes in, in my regard in a very uh, dualistic mindsets. For example, 
international relation literature often has these uh, frameworks of thinking about liberation and repression. And this already is a problem for me as a sociologist because <coughs> this, I cannot kind of make the boundaries, draw the boundaries so easily between those things. They always come <laughs> with one another. I mean, and there's many, many other shades of that in between and whatever. So it was, but, but still it became even more interesting through, through that problem I had with this literature to look at those things for me. So what we did is we looked at policy documents, uh, at least the ones we could understand, which is another big problem I would like to talk about, uh, because of course we did not have any native uh, speakers um, in our group. So what we did is we first of all looked for documents in English, which were mostly uh, documents from China, India and Brazil that were either translations of laws and regulations or translations of speeches or comments to speeches of politicians or uh, 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 strategy papers. This was one block of information which we had and which we already have coded, so this is done. But of course, this is just the parts that were somehow available in English. Then we had some laws and docu strategy documents that were not in English, so we had to kind of translate them and work with the translations and then check again with some uh, colleagues of ours who, who are native speakers <coughs> if we kind of got it right, which was a very laborious pro uh, process. And then, of course, uh, we had all these other uh, sources of knowledge, like media, for example, media discourse, which is, of course, so different in China to as it is in Brazil to as it is in India. So it is quite a, it's, it's, it first, it, I've never done this before, this kind of comparative work. And uh, this was the first moment where I said, oh, can we really do this big comparison? I mean, it's very, very different. So, but for international relation people, this is no problem at all. <laughs> <laughs> they do that all the time. So this is also why, I, why I'm improvising here a bit today. Um, so uh, basically, those, uh, was, this was the situation. This is where we are right now. We have these policy documents coded. We have we started to analyze it in a discourse analytic method with continent analytical uh, uh, tools. And now we were starting to look at media. Very, very uh, complicated things uh, popped up. But anyway, so we, we could say our first conclusions, which we have is that, of course, everything is very dif different and difficult. Uh, for example, if you look at uh, Brazil, uh, there you have a very broad discourse, actually, and you have a lot of public discourse in regard to repression or, and also but more, more or less repression of uh, uh, happening in the context of uh, big data and privacy. So this is a big, big topic. And uh, there is, from the government side, there is a very strong focus on the economic and social development in the country overall. But interestingly, this is not really reflected in the laws that we found. So this is maybe more a, a narrative which is then not operationalized into some laws. Very, very different to China and India. Uh, you can see that it, there are some examples of big data policy uh, uh, stuff going on and big data policy slash industry stuff going on in Brazil, like some uh, police related or law enforcement related uh, applications. But then most of the time the, the technology is bought into the country. So they are kind of, they outsource the technology. And in that case, it is an American consortium, that in, in industry consortium with the uh, New York Police Department that um, sells um, their uh, knowledge and technology. Uh, so this is just an example. So this is the, the case in Brazil. You have a very strong uh, public discourse about privacy and then also uh, critical uh, approaches to the legislation regulating. And interestingly, the government in Brazil, and this again would link to China, makes very strong uh, um, stances or, or arguments uh, of the geopolitical dimension of big data. So for example, the Brazilian government has been involved in an alliance also with China and, and India, I think, and other states uh, to kind of uh, build a Global South data infrastructure initiative that uh, is then a bit reflected in this World Internet uh, Conference that, that uh, was um, installed. Then the next case, India. Uh, yeah, sorry. In Brazil, the, the whole liberation 
slash repression narratives are very prominent, discussed in public, of course. Uh, and the government appears much more invested in those narratives because there, there is this public pressure to do so. Mm. And in India, for example, this is again very different. You have a lot, a lot of things going on already. Some of you might be familiar with the application or the, the whole system called Adha, which is not a social credit system in that sense, but it's more like a social identification system that allows uh, uh, citizens, well actually first of all the, the empowerment idea behind Adha is to allow people to be entered into the system. For example, India had the problem that every year they had, eight, they had 18 million births that were not accounted for, they were not visible in any system. So they wanted to bring those things into the system so that those people can become citizens, be, can vote, can do all these things. So this is the idea of, uh, this is the democratic empowerment idea there. And uh, they talk a lot about those things as well. So, and ADHA is, is more or less also an, an infrastructure that uh, is uh, uh, developed together with industry partners, but still the government uh, stays, as far as we understand it, the owner of the data. Uh, and it's the, the, the infrastructural companies, they are kind of um, outsourced, they that have been outsourced uh, uh, to, they kind of are not the owners of this data that is in there, very different to China. Uh, and so the government itself is not allocating itself a, a big like a strategic role besides ADHA in the big data development, but the government gives away a lot of grants for big data technology because it has understood that it can uh, uh, fuel the economy. And China, I think we don't have to talk about it so much anymore because we have heard uh, in both presentations uh, many things about it. Uh, the, the, the public visions are made very prominent in China. I mean, since 2010, you can see all these white papers floating around, even in English, that kind of uh, provide us this shiny new world of uh, uh, efficient politics, basically. This is the main, um, and that is similar to India also. This is the main narrative that we found there to make politics more efficient. And different, well, a bit it is also in India, but very prominently in China, it's this relation of big data and open data, which is interesting for us, which I still don't understand, and I wish we could have a discussion on that as well. So it's this idea, of, of course, of open government data, and to make, so in a way, the interaction between the local governments also much better, because uh, they there has been a problem of efficiency of them communicating, and I guess uh, with the social credit system, this will become even a bigger problem. And uh, but it's also, in a way, they always in the narrative you will always find the citizens that have a right to see that data. So you, all these things, uh, in a way, we found out and a lot more. So there are, in a way, now big, big open questions. First of all, how is this idea of big data and digital society linked to ideas of openness in terms of empowerment again, but also efficiency. <coughs> and how uh, are those uh, industry, like government industry relation, the, uh, industrial, government industrial complex, if you like, how are they kind of uh, mirrored in those strategies? So this is what we're working on right now. And I was I was wondering, and this is, I, I would like to end now my, my presentation, or at least my uh, uh, improvisation, with some questions that I think I would like to pose to, to all of you, uh, especially, because I was wondering uh, what your view is on, first of all, the uh, idea of uh, this industry government cooperation, which is in China. Uh, I mean, it's huge. I, I, today it was very important for me to listen to you because I didn't know it was that huge, especially with Alibaba, uh, who owns the data anyway. And I was wondering if you could tell us a bit more about how also those stakeholders pushed this idea of the social credit system first. How, if you could find out somehow, because this would be the next question, a whole block of questions, the methodology, how can we find out those things? It's not so easy to find people who, to tell you those uh, stories. <laughs> how did they, m in a way, co-shape the algorithm that is defining the, the score? 
uh, because that's always super interesting when you start looking into the algorithms. It's a question, if you can, that if you read all the official Chinese policy documents, you would think, ha, they will make the algorithm open because that's how they kind of uh, uh, en enhance uh, their efficient government and citizen empowerment. So this would be the next set of questions. How is this algorithm constructed and how do the industrial stakeholders uh, kind of push what goes into it? or basically define what goes into it, because they have the data anyway, and they had all these things happening before, probably since 1999. They have prepared that. And the, the second uh, big question is, because you were talking about those bike companies, I would be a uh, bicycle. Of course, we have this, you know, it's another of these cliches where we think about Asia, we think about bicycles. And, and the, but the question is, I think, um, how, uh, do those, or can you find out if those companies kind of join those uh, systems um, deliberately because they think it's so efficient and so practical, uh, they can see the, 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 the um, um, financial uh, score of this person and they know this, will, this person will be able to pay the bicycle he rented, or did they join because there is some kind of political pressure that they have uh, felt upon them? So this was some particular questions that I wanted to ask. Thanks for your attention.